So I think there's lots of ways this myth creeps up. It's sort of this rotten root at the bottom of the painting hobby. Welcome to another episode of Miniature Painting Mythbusting. My name is Chris, probably better known as Travarian, and my co-host for the show is Vince Venturello. Our goal is to take ideas that exist in the miniature painting community and to throw our combined experience of 40 years within the hobby against them to see if they hold water. Today we have another myth that exists since the dawn of miniature painting, and I hope you are as excited as we are to find out more about it. Thanks, Wins, for being on another episode of Myth Busting. Happy to be here. Uh, it's been a while, but we are back. Um, the question that I want to propose today, or the myth, and I don't think that is something that is explicitly stated anywhere, so no one goes to a forum and says that exact question or myth, uh, and then people say yeah and or no, but it's more an implicit thing where people think there is one correct way to paint a miniature and i think there is multiple layers to that um but what is your take on it yeah i think this crops up all the time i think that uh whether you're talking about in painting technique right uh, meaning that the proper way to achieve a finished product is only this road i.e. I can only use this set of techniques to achieve the end product, whether we mean the finish and the look of the miniature, right? As though there's one platonic form, some sacred perfect triangle of what the miniature is and, you know, can be, or whether we just mean the quality of the output. Uh, so what I mean here is one of the most common things I hear people say, especially newer folks when they're starting out, is something along the lines of, some paraphrase of, I am a perfectionist. And so I don't want to paint my miniatures because I'm afraid I can't make it perfect. Or I spend too long painting my miniatures because I'm trying to make them perfect, right? So I think there's lots of ways this myth creeps up. It's sort of this rotten root at the bottom of the painting hobby. Yeah, I think that's a bit of a problem. It uh, it can be really paralyzing um, if you just have that notion of that there is something I can do to paint the perfect miniature. So the idea alone that there is a perfect way to paint a miniature can be demoralizing and almost paralyzing and you could end up not painting anything. And that's why we think we have to talk about this myth to make the miniature painting hobby more healthy and more enjoyable to everyone. Because sticking to that idea has the potential to create so many artificial ways that you can perceive as screwing up and to make mistakes when most of it is just about different ways to get a result. In the following conversation we try to analyze which misconceptions exist that amplify these ideas of there being a perfect way to paint the miniature and if only you followed these steps, you'd get a great miniature. We identified the way that a lot of people think about colors, technique, and a third big category, not knowing about the fact that miniature painting is all about different interpretations of the same figure. So let's dive into all of these one by one, and let's start with color. This is always a big question. Um, obviously we had the, uh, the question of how many paints do you need but all of this comes also down to is there the correct color to use which obviously is something that doesn't exist no this is this is this is such a good point you're making right here the idea that because it's leather it has to be the color of my paints that says leather brown or because it is and we're not even talking about like a space marine that's part of a certain chapter, hence they need to be this exact shade of red. That's a totally different conversation. We're that just is saying true. we'll not hit on that <laughs> because we don't have another half an hour. Correct. I'm just saying the things we see, this leather thing needs to be brown. These boots need to be black, right? We all have this 
these defaults that we believe is the only color. But that's all nonsense. There is a, a studio called Craft World Studio. They use almost all traditional hues instead of things like blacks, whites, browns, and neutrals uh, to achieve all of this stuff. Yes, there's probably some level of rationality that you have to put in there. For example, if you make the leather belt bright pink and it's the only bright pink thing on the mini, that's going to look weird. But color interpretation is so vast right i'm just going to stick to the leather belt because we've all been there and i i know you watching out there you've got your brown leather that you use when it comes to a belt you know you do i do we all do but the reality is you could mix you could make that belt deep red you could make it deep green you could make it a, a strange blue brown color whatever because ultimately what's going to define it more is things like the texture you apply to it, the way that you highlight the thing, and its relation to the rest of the mini. If in the color scheme of the rest of the mini, it works, then you can speak in that language. But that's a tough thing, right? That's a thing you learn through experience over time. This is one of those places where it's better to start with maybe those defaults make the black boots and the brown leather to start because part of your map is already filled in, right? But as you go, don't feel like that's the only thing it can be because that's not correct. It's just easy. Yeah, and I guess um, on the example, I mean, apart from probably only Vince Venturel being able to do a green belt, the thing is, uh, leather itself does not just is is not just black. I mean, we can say that for everything, right? N no white thing. I mean, just look at my background; it's a white wall, but obviously, it's not just white. If I went in there with Photoshop, I would be able to just pull maybe one pixel out there. Maybe if I lean to this side a bit more, that is exactly white. But yeah, so leather is not just brown or black. There's variations to it. And yes, you can start from a point that is um, feels correct to a lot of us uh, when we look at it. But you should also be aware um, that there's a lot of roots, like you say, to go down to make that leather boot your leather boot. <laughs> This is my interpretation of one letter. I boiled down the steps into something that everyone can follow. But in the end, everyone that follows it comes up with a very different result. And that's great. There's no perfect way to do it. Maybe your idea of letter is darker. Maybe you want it less scratched up or even a little bit different in color. The next idea within this concept of a perfect miniature is that if only we found that one perfect technique that we can learn and replicate would be on a good way. But it's a bit more complicated than that. To learn to paint or to really know how to paint, you have to unlearn a lot of things and um, especially thinking in, in techniques. Obviously, when we do content, we kind of want to talk about techniques because it's a yeah distinct concept that people can think about, that we can talk about. But... Uh, rarely do I use just a particular technique. So I don't just use layering, which has a certain opacity or whatever. A lot of the time it's a mix of uh, glazing and layering, and I cannot tell you where it starts and where it stops. It's just the right amount of paint with the right opacity in the right moment. So you cannot use the correct technique in that case to yeah, achieve a, um, like you said, perfect form. It doesn't exist. You can just apply something that uh, works in that exact moment for what you want to achieve. Yeah, 100%. I think that where this becomes the most challenging is when people believe that the exact techniques, methodology, whatever we want to say, of the person or painters that they particularly follow are the only ways to paint. Uh, there's a lot of us painting on YouTube and I watch all of it and I love all of it, but there is a lot of very different styles or techniques or whatever you wanna say being utilized to achieve an end product. And 
I think the problem comes with when when we all watch that, we know, oh, that's just that person's set of techniques that they use. Sure, that's how they do it. They use thousands and thousands of tiny little dots. That's their method. Everything is stippling, right? And they never actually do a brush stroke. Some other person is only doing rough value sketching and then using an airbrush over the top to smooth everything out, okay? Different set of techniques being utilized. None of those are ultimately correct. They're correct for that person because that's what that person has trained on, has practiced with, understands the nuances and pitfalls of, knows how to correct mistakes when doing, and can ultimately create a, a you know a very nice, aesthetically pleasing finished product while doing it. Uh, so it's not as though not it's not just that there's not one right technique, right? Certainly you can't paint a whole miniature using just one sort of technique. Like the idea that you you're just going to do the whole min miniature and you're only going to layer or something like that is, is completely missing the forest for the trees. It's some people won't even layer at all. Right? They'll, they'll do something completely different or they'll only glaze with the airbrush or whatever. None of those are the quote unquote right way and none of those necessarily produce a better miniature in the end than any of the other techniques i think we can even reduce that so something that is always entry level ish is uh, the avia metal or i'm sorry that's my own that's my own videos avia than metal no uh, it's the heavy metal style um which technically is a very simple style right it is um an edge highlight on top of a base layer that is maybe washed or shaded in some way and then you're doing the edge highlights but in reality it's not so even with um with that it is a broader stroke on the edge and then a more confined stroke that is uh, covering less area with a brighter color and even if you want to copy that and there's a couple of videos out there where people try to do the heavy metal style right and you can see that it's just not exactly the the same way simply because even with very basic techniques you're not going to be able to reproduce exactly that thing that you want to reproduce simply because of all the stuff you mentioned like idiosyncratic ways to hold the brush or whatever right um so trying to reproduce these uh, painters that are painting since forever uh, it's not going to work um, you can take in their ideas uh, and you can try them out and you kind of should accept that they're coming they're going to come out the way you are doing it um, it's not going to be an exact copy and in my opinion you should embrace that yeah it's going to be your own style it's going to be you're going to have your own quirks, uh, your own ways to apply paint, whatever technique you're using. And that's fine. Yeah. I, when you look at something like Evier Metal or Evy Metal, I did it too. You, you've indelibly left a mark in all of our minds, Treverian. When I think of the Evy Metal style, what comes to my mind is a lot of soft shading and these certain signifiers, right? Extreme cleanliness. Right. And, and it's amazing because it's a studio of 20 people who are all and you couldn't. And they even split up projects. Sometimes person A will paint, you know, literally the mount and person B will paint the writer or something. And yet they look completely harmonious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've all gotten together and they've managed to sort of harmonize despite their differences. Because as you mentioned, idiosyncrasies in painting matter a lot. And the fact that they've managed to harmonize most of that out to the point where they're all, you know, they'll paint a unit and one person does two and one person does three and another person does, you know, and five. And, and it's like when they put all 10 of them together, you couldn't spot who did what. That's incredible. Can you know, right? is it that precise? I want to say, because I, I'll throw one thing out. Um, I don't know who does it, but uh, there's that one painter that does a lot of the blood bowl teams and he's really awesome simply because of the way that uh yeah his color interactions are so it's a technical standpoint he's way above others in that team i would say and um yeah both com color combination wise and technicality wise <laughs> so well here's what i'll say mm -hmm. so if you remember the uh the chaos warriors that released 
more recently, the more dynamically posed Chaos Warriors. Yep. Okay, so that was a unit of 10 Chaos Warriors. Uh, I believe three different heavy metal painters did that unit. And I would challenge anyone to find, you know, to try to create the groupings that was done, right? I just, I, I've stared at them. I even know who painted some of them, and I can't tell a difference between that and the other ones, right? So my point is they've done a good job of, of creating a, a harmonized style. So with a lot of training and being in a rigid work environment where everything is about coherent results, like Games Workshop's painting studio, for example, we can get these copy-paste paint jobs. You can copy someone's traits, but people will always end up and will want to end up developing their own style. When I look at the heavy metal style, it's certainly one method you can aspire to. It has signifiers but it's not a perfect mini I, and i don't mean that in any negative way that's not a judgment my statement is there is no such thing as a perfect mini it just doesn't exist because if you look at the evy metal mini versus what say darren latham somebody who was on the evy metal team for a long time would paint himself it's going to look different. He paints in a sort of hyper version of the heavy metal style. But at the same time, I look at when you get these Space Marines or something like that that you see in the heavy metal style a lot, interpreted by other painters, say Roman's recent Space Marines he did, right? For his, his kill team that he was working on. Completely different interpretation of the methods and techniques used. Or Dave Caldwell's chaos marines that he did that series again completely different techniques used all of these are fantastically beautiful interpretations of the mini but that's it we need to stop thinking in terms of perfect minis and start thinking in terms of interpretation yeah i think that's a perfect segue because the other point that i wrote down on my list is uh, I just wrote shapes, but obviously I'm a big fan of volumetric highlighting. Uh, I think so, so are you. And that means <laughs> we're going to a whole other level because it's somewhat um, straightforward to find an edge or find all edges in a miniature and highlight them in the same way or in a particular way, let's put it that way. But once you are looking at yeah the shapes of a miniature, say you're trying to identify a sphere and the cylinder or maybe combination of both. And then there obviously is a, hmm, you can look at a sphere at a shiny object. Huh. There's so many, many implications there already. Okay. Let's, let's say a, a shiny object, a, a shiny sphere. You can look at that and in a certain light uh, situation, it's, you're going to have a reflection pattern that is typical for that one situation. But now you can change the surface uh, to make it dull and that whole thing changes. Um, the reflection pattern becomes more diffuse and uh, you can see less sharp reflections. And then, yeah, just maybe add another light and uh, you're completely in a different world already there. So I think that is also when we go back to the beginning statements where people say, I don't want to start, I, I need to get this perfectly right, then yeah, sure, you're going to be able to paint that particular correct setting if you set um, your light source to, I don't know, 90 degrees or whatever, but in the end it doesn't matter because there's so many different ways to paint the sphere because there's just that many uh, scenarios you can put that sphere in that you don't really have to get this uh, perfectly right, you just have to be somewhat consistent over all the shapes i would say but yeah it just has to be credible all the reflections have to be there because bounce light and main reflection is a thing right everything else you can just define those shapes the way you want to i think your example of a shiny sphere is so perfect for so many reasons because we've all seen an art installation of like a mirror ball sitting in a fountain or in a, a park or something like that. It's a very common sort of thing that's around in the world. And that reflection that's coming off of that mirror ball will vary greatly. There's no perfect way to paint that. 
because as you mentioned, maybe the light changes. Like let's say a stable mirror ball. It's not moving. It's only in one place. The reflection that's going to come off of it is going to change based on the time of day. Where's the light? What other lights are around? It's going to change based on the other stuff that's around it. It's going to change based on where you are looking at it from, your viewing angle. If you stand on your tippy toes, it will look different to you than if you got down and laid on the ground and looked up at it. So when we say there's no perfect form of that ball, that's right there just shows how even I never moved the ball. I didn't put it in a different setting. And there are a near infinite number of ways that that thing could look. So it's about finding your interpretation of it, right? I think the other thing you mentioned there is this comes out a lot with things like the inclusion of lighting color and how you choose to in interpret colors of light and things like that. Some people favor much more heavily colored light influence uh, in the same way that I'm just shooting in a normal room here with white lights. A lot of people do YouTube content with like red and blue and different colored lights in the background. You know, some people prefer their miniatures like that too. They'll frequently infuse lots of colored light into the miniature, not necessarily because they're trying to push OSL, but because they just like the look of that heavy, not object source lighting, but heavy colored environmental lighting. I tend to have a more standard, assuming a kind of warm highlight look, because that's what I tend to like. But there's no right way there. Those are different interpretations. Yeah, and I'm always careful with throwing the word art around with miniature painting, but it is an artistic uh, endeavor. And the question that I have is, does art have a correct way? So is there a correct way to do art? And I'm going to answer it. <laughs> Uh, there's not right it's it's art you should do it the way you enjoy it and uh, you should not be doing it for others necessarily yeah when you put it in terms that simple it's so obvious anybody would just cotton to it immediately the problem is we have this dissociation right where we think oh because we've seen the box art of the miniature or some version of the thing that we particularly like. We think, oh, there is a perfect version and it's not like art where obviously there is no one perfect way or correct way to art, <laughs> yeah. right? We, we're very accepting of that premise in, in that world. And I think we just need to understand that the same rules apply to miniature painting. So these are the three main reasons that cause the most frustration in a new and even in more advanced miniature painters when they chase this ideal picture of a perfect mini. And there might be some more, so if you find we haven't covered everything, let us know in the comments. But with a clear conscience, we can say that the myth of the ideal or perfect way to paint the miniature is definitely busted. There was one minor thing to address before we set our sights on the next bit. I guess to wrap it up, um, I want to at least, unless you find we forgot something, um, say where does this originate from? Where is this? I guess uh, if a miniature painter comes to a forum and, and asks, can you tell me the correct way to paint this figure? Where, where does that idea come from? Well, I think it's a natural human instinct. We want to have the steps. A lot of us in our videos will talk about the exact steps or recipes or whatever. I mean, we've covered recipes in previous in a previous discussion. And we want to believe that there is a map, especially when we don't know enough at the beginning, right? When we start out, we want to believe there's a map. And there is a map. The problem is it's literally a map. If I'm trying to get to a different city from where I live, there are many different roads I could take to get there. Especially if it's Rome, right? That's right. If it's Rome, then they all, they all go there. Some might take longer than others. Some might have more scenic views than others. Some might be under construction and be a rougher drive. But in the end, I will arrive at the city in question as long as I take one of the correct roads. The key is there's many correct roads. But it's very tricky when you're just starting out and you can't see the whole map. 
right? There's no Google Maps I can fire up to see all the different potential routes when I'm a new miniature painter. I know so little of the vast amount that you there is to learn in this hobby that it feels like, oh, there's the place I want to be. Perfect done miniature. There must be one way to get from where I am to that place. I think that's actually a pretty perfect analogy because some people might prefer to go there the fastest way. And some people just want to see as much of the scenery on the way um, and take their time, right? And I don't like to pat myself on the back, but I think that's the very essence of miniature painting. It's our own personal journey and we should try to enjoy it. If you liked this video, then don't forget to subscribe to this channel, but also to Vince's channel because the episodes alternate between the two. I'm going to leave a link to his channel in the description and I'm also going to put the link there to the playlist if you want to watch the episodes from start to finish. If you have any suggestions for ideas or myths that exist within our community for Vince and myself to take a look at, leave them in the comments section. Thanks for watching and see you in the next episode. In the following conversation we try to analyze which myths... Okay, so we hit on... Uh, no. Okay, obviously another thing is that's always... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's okay, you're getting good outtake stuff here. Yeah. Okay, so... <laughs>